everybody. We have a few fewer numbers this Sunday than we did last Sunday, but I, I think it's because we've got uh, more cases popping up in Ward County and um, different situations like that. And so we're very mindful of that and very prayerful um, in regards to that situation. You know, I think all of us kind of hoped by now we would be, you know, on the other end of this. And uh, it seems like we're right in the middle of it, but uh, we'll, we'll get through it and we'll make it. And um, we'll, we'll pray and, and uh, do our best to stay well. And so very grateful for everybody's presence. Some of you may have noticed that the monitor is now on this area here. I, I hate to call this a stage. I don't know. It's always weird calling it a stage. Maybe it is. And, uh, you know, the reason that's there is because it was a lot easier to move the monitor than it was for me to get new glasses. And um, <laughs> because I couldn't see the thing. So. <laughs> But we're very glad that you're here. We're very grateful that you've come to uh, spend some time with us in this time of worship. It's a wonderful reminder uh, to be here, to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It reminds us of, of what, what we're, our purpose is. It reminds us of our salvation that we have in Jesus. It reminds us of the fellowship that we have. And it reminds us of the future home we have with God. And we are very grateful for that reminder. Um, in just a moment, we'll have a reminder of a sacrifice that was made in our behalf, and we're beyond grateful for that sacrifice that was made. Jeff is going to be leading us in our singing, and he'll be coming up here in just a moment to do that. And so for now, if we can clear our minds of any of our worldly cares, and let's focus on worshiping our, our Heavenly Father. Speaking of monitors, I've never used one, so I'm going to tell you all the page number, and if you want to follow along, that's fine. If not, I think it's going to be up there anyway. So we're going to start off this morning with uh, We Praise the Old God on page 33. We're going to sing the first, second, and fifth verse. <clears throat> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. <clears throat> All right, and our song before the prayer will be glorify thy name. And we're going to sing all three verses. <coughs> Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the Glory. 
band. <clears throat> so, you glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Pray with me, please. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful this time that you've let us assemble and worship and sing praise you to you, the only true living God. Our Heavenly Father, we love you so much and we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you so abundantly bestow upon us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your Son that you sent to this earth that died and was brought back alive that we might have redemption of our sins. Heavenly Father, we just want to be with the ones at this time that are sick and sad at heart, the ones that are lost, just let them find a way to redemption and all. Just be with the ones that are affected by this, this disease we have at this time. And we know that all things come from you, and uh, we just know that this and that you control this, our Heavenly Father. Just be with the people that are in management of this government at this time, that they might manage in a way that will help all people people that are working on the COVID-19 vaccine that they might find it and they might bring a cure back to this disease. Just be with this country at this time. We know that it's unsettled at this time and there's rancor and all things of hate, but we know that this goes on in life. You could do it with a just common hand over this world at this time. Just let people step back and look. Now, Heavenly Father, what we have over the, the non-believers that we have that we can be footed in the face. That we have you to look to, that we know all things come from you. Heavenly Father, we just want to be with the ones that have lost loved ones here in the recent moments, at the lowest of time. We just be with them and comfort them as only you can. Again, our Heavenly Father, we just thank you to put a calming hand on this state so that we might just look forward to you and just the coming of you. Heavenly Father, we again just want to bless everybody in this assembly today, the ones that's watching on the just TV screens and all, just be with them too. Just people that are wringing their hands, just be with them and comfort them as only you can. This shall pass also. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your son. But most of all, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we have that we can come and worship you without the fear of ridicule or persecution. It's his name we pray. Amen. Y'all can now join me and he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. All right, and our song before communion will be on page 371, When We Meet in Sweet Communion. When we meet in sweet communion, where the feast divine is spread, hearts are brought in closer union while partaking of the bread. Precious feast, all else surpassing, wondrous love for you and me while we feast christ gently whispers do this in my memory 
God so loved what wondrous measure loved and gave the best of hell bought us with that matchless treasure yea for us his life was given precious feast all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me while we feast christ gently whispers do this in my memory feast divine all else surpassing precious blood for you and me while we sup christ gently whispers do this in my memory precious feast all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me while we feast christ gently whispers do this in my memory If you'll get your bread and uh, juice, fruit of the vine uh, available, we'll participate in the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> if you did not pick one up as you came in this morning and need one, just raise your hand, Brett's in the back, and be glad to, to bring one uh, to you. Uh, but um, if you will uh, prepare yourself, we'll uh, partake together. You know, um, Jeff referred to this as the communion a moment ago, and then we sang a song that refers to this as the communion, and that's one of the words that we use for what we're doing now. Sometimes we call it the Lord's Supper. Uh, we have uh, different terms that we refer uh, to this memorial. Um, but I, this, this word communion um, sort of brings to light or brings to mind um, what we're enjoying as, as we start to come back together uh, physically, as we start to be able to assemble together. Sean said two or three times, you know, uh, that this, this time apart is, has really reminded us of how precious it is to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and be encouraged by one another and see one another. And uh, it just means uh, we knew it was important before, but I think we've been reminded of it uh, through this, this difficult time. And, and this idea of communion is, um, has that idea. It's that idea of, of joining together in uh, participating together. The, the word that is translated communion is also the word that's translated fellowship. Um, in other places, it's, it can be translated joint participation. Uh, when we talk about fellowshipping together, being together, participating together, communing together, uh, all of those words carry the same idea. And so, so as we participate this morning, uh, there is a sense, of course, in which the Lord participates with us, uh, but there also is a, a tremendous uh, emphasis on the fact that we're participating with one another. Uh, whether you're watching online and participating with us or whether you're here in the uh, auditorium this morning, uh, we are participating together in remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And, and in fact, we're participating with Christians all over the world uh, who are remembering uh, on this Lord's Day as well. And uh, we're, we're saying to one another uh, and we are saying to the Lord that we um, believe in Jesus, that we understand um, what his death means for us. We proclaim his death until he comes. We, we proclaim to the Lord how important it is to us and, and we know that it is the basis for our forgiveness uh, and therefore our relationship with God. 
Um, this is a familiar passage, of course, in 1 Corinthians 11, as Paul reminds the Corinthian uh, Christians, brethren, of uh, Jesus' institution of this uh, memorial. And so beginning in verse 23, uh, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so again, this is what we're doing this morning. We're remembering um, what Jesus has done on our behalf in his sacrifice. And in a sense, we are proclaiming it to one another and really to the world how important it is to us. So if you have your, your bread available, uh, we'll pray together and then you are uh, encouraged to partake. Let's, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for loving us and blessing us in so many ways. Uh, most of all, Father, we thank you for Jesus and for the tremendous sacrifice that he made on our behalf. As we commune together, as we fellowship together and participate together this morning, Father, we, we join together in, in expressing our gratitude for his sacrifice, expressing our faith in what it means to us and to the relationship that we have with you through him. Father, thank you for this bread that does, as we just read, does remind us of Jesus' body on the cross. May we uh, partake of it in a, in a mindful manner, a grateful manner. Thank you again, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you have your fruit of the vine available, we will pray again, and then you're encouraged uh, to partake. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, as we continue thinking about and remembering and um, just uh, being grateful for the blessing that we have in Jesus uh, through his sacrifice, uh, again, as we just read, this cup reminds us of his blood that was shed on our behalf on the cross uh, through which we have atonement through which we have forgiveness and thank you father for that forgiveness thank you also for the opportunity to remember it in this way this morning in jesus name we pray amen Normally in our service after the communion, we take up a collection for the work here and in Athens, other works that we support. As you know, we're not passing the plate, but there is a, a place uh, there in the lobby uh, or in the foyer as you come through. If you are prepared to make a contribution, uh, you may do so there. All right, if y'all want to stand and we're going to sing a song before the lesson, we'll be on page 143. We have come into his house. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him let's forget about ourselves 
and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Good morning. I'm sure it was three times, Greg, because preachers say everything in threes. Yes. But it bears repeating. It is, it is good. It is good to be here. It's good to be back. It's um, definitely um, more important to us. I was just thinking about that as we were singing, that that, that is something we really miss. I don't know uh, about y'all, but we you know, kind of had a hard time singing at home. You know, when you don't have the congregation with you, it's not as easy. And, uh, but it's, it's nice to hear that. You know? And I have to say that in the past, I've taken that for granted, uh, especially the singing. Um, singing nights were not always my favorite nights at congregations we've been at, but you know, it, you really grow a great appreciation for that and that what it means um, and what it, just what it feels like um, to be together as a family and praise the Lord in song and word. We're going to continue our study this morning. In fact, we're going to wrap up our study on the, on the kingdom parables in Matthew chapter 13. We've been spending a lot of time in this and just unpacking Jesus' words here. And our focus and our goal has been to really uh, try to come to grips with what the kingdom truly uh, is, what it does, how it influences the world. And it is kind of surprising when you really dig into it and find out what God had in mind. Um, something that we may not have expected, something that we may not have planned. Um, and that's sometimes, in, in a lot of cases, how we recognize that it was from God. It's because we, we would never have come up with such a, a marvelous plan. We would never have come up with such a, an idea to bring about something so powerful, but yet do it in such a, a humble means. Um, the Messiah, Jesus. Just think about Jesus. Just think about who he is. Think about what he's done. And think about how he came into this world. And that just gives you a clue as to the mind of God, how he functions and how he works um, in ways that are sometimes mysterious to us. Um, but to God are, are the wisdom of heaven, kingdom wisdom. And so it's been, it's been great being able to study these things. But one thing that's been on my mind as I've been looking at the text and reading through the text, um, I've been thinking about about time. Um, thinking about time. We've been waiting all this time to come back and now we're back and, and now there's this question in our minds, how long is this going to last? Are we going to continue to come back? And, and I know those are questions in your mind too. They're questions in my mind as well. Um, but time. How much longer are we going to be in this world that we're in right now? How much longer are we going to have this thing uh, hanging over us um, dictating what we do and, and how we function? How much time? And so that's what I've been thinking about in regards to this text is time, um, the future. And it's hard for us, I think, at least for me, in the present, to think about the future. We, we think about time in regards to our current experience. And it's hard for us to look to the future and say, um, things are going to change. Things are going to be different. Things are not always going to be the same. Because if you're a lot like I am, I feel like things are just going to be the same. You're going to wake up every morning, it's going to be the same thing, same day, same kind of idea, and things just kind of move along. And we get into those habits and we get into those ruts. But the reality is things are not always going to be the same. And, and, and I think about the Jewish people of this day, and I think about Jesus preaching to them and talking to them. I think about all of the, the, the social and political unrest that was going on in Jesus' day. Very divided. Very divided. The people of Israel, the Jewish people, were divided. Rome was divided with the Jews. There, there was so much division, so much, so much of a power-hungry mentality. Who's going to win? Who's going to be victorious? What is time going to bring us? What is the future going to look like? And, and specifically, when the Messiah comes. And that was a great expectation for the Jews. They had in their mind this, this expectation 
I know I've mentioned that a lot of times, but it's really important for us to understand and put ourselves in the place of the Jewish people. They expected the Messiah to come. And with the Messiah was going to come judgment. And with that judgment was going to come the great kingdom of God. And all of this was going to happen all at once. It was going to be abrupt. It was going to be fast. When the seed of Abraham comes, when the seed of David comes, all of this is going to be dealt with. All this political unrest, all this social unrest, all, all of this division, it's going to be dealt with when the Messiah comes. So I want you to kind of put yourself in the place of, of these Jews in Jesus' day. I know it's hard for us to do that, but try to think back and put yourself in this place. That's your expectation. That's your hope. That's the future. And so now you hear rumors that the Messiah has come. And you, you go and you go to the shore and you listen to this man who is out in a boat that people are saying might be or is the Messiah. And you listen to him and you listen to his words and, and you're thinking with hopeful expectation that you're going to hear him say something that's going to line up with your current expectation. You're going to hear him say that tomorrow's the day or the next day is the day or next week is, is the time that the kingdom is going to come and it's going to come abruptly and it's going to put an end to all other kingdoms and God's rule and reign will be the only rule and reign and God will be victorious and all of the problems are going to go away. And you sit there and you listen. And, and this man in the boat begins talking about things that seem unrelated. A sower who goes out to sow seed. What does that have to do with the kingdom? What does that have to do with your expectations? What does that have to do with God's victory? What does that have to do with putting an end to all other kingdoms? The sower goes out to seed. Sow seed. The tares among the wheat. And you think, well, what does that have to do with the kingdom? What does that have to do with the expectation that I have of the kingdom coming? Or, or the mustard seed? Or, or the, the, the leaven in the dough? And you listen to this man and you think to yourself, we don't have time. Don't you know what's going on? Can't you see what's going on around you? Can't you feel the tension? Can't you feel the pressure that is coming upon us? We don't have time time. We don't have time to grow a field. We don't have time to grow a tree. We don't have time for any of this. We don't have time. And that's the kind of tension that is beginning to build in Jesus' ministry as he continues to preach the kingdom gospel. The reality is, someday, someday, what they expected will happen. Someday, God is going to put an end abruptly to all other kingdoms. Someday, God is going to deal with injustice in the world. Someday, God is going to take care of evil. Someday, God is going to come in Jesus and deal with all the problems of the world. And it's going to be fast. And it's going to be abrupt. And it's happening. Judgment's coming. Someday. But for now, the kingdom has come in a very unusual way. A very unique way. A very unexpected way and will impact greatly the world that we know. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 47. We're going to kind of do this a little backwards, but I want to look at this parable first. Jesus, in speaking about the kingdom, this was the, towards the end of these parables that Jesus spoke in the boat publicly. And then we'll begin to see parables that Jesus will speak privately to his disciples. So we have this public parable speech and then a private parable speech. And there's going to be a difference in the nature of these parables. Now the kingdom, Jesus says, of heaven is like a dragnet. It's cast into the sea. And, and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and they gathered the good fish into containers. But the bad fish they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the scene would have been very familiar as to most of Jesus' parables. They would have been a very familiar scene. Especially being there on the shore, there could have very well been people already doing this, you know, as, as Jesus is talking about this parable. And so people sitting on the shore sorting fish, the catch of the day. This would have been a familiar scene to them. And this parable is very similar to the tares and the wheat that we've talked about before. 
The big difference is the focus of the parable. It's not necessarily the, the coexisting of good and evil in the world as much as it is this, this end times bringing together this separation is, seems to be a more of the focus of this particular parable. Jesus is saying someday, someday the net's going to be drug in. Someday that, that work is going to be done and the net's going to come to shore and all of a sudden there's going to be this great separation. The good fish and the bad fish. The righteous and the wicked. And, and the wicked are going to be cast into the fire. It's, it's kind of that, that imagery that we see of hell itself, right? Just thrown into the fire to burn the eternal fires of hell. And, but there's going to be this, this other bucket, right? It's kind of odd to think about the kingdom as a bucket, but it's kind of the way it's going, isn't it, with the parable? And it's going to contain all the righteous people, the, these good fish, if you will. And, and so the idea is clear that there's going to be a day. A day is coming. A day is coming when the whole world's going to be judged. Everybody's going to be judged. Nobody's going to be exempt from this. The whole world is going to be judged. And the kingdom will come. And it will come with force. And it will come with power. And it will come abruptly. And, and these angels are going to be working. And Jesus is going to be working. And God's going to be working. And it's coming. It's Jesus' point, isn't it? A day is coming. Patience, time, time, and patience. But someday, someday, it's all going to be dealt with. And so the big question that we have to ask ourselves when we read about this is what is it worth to you? What is it worth to you? What, what value do you place on this? What is it worth to you to be among the righteous on that day? What is it worth to you to be among the wheat versus the tares, the good fish versus the wicked fish? What, what value have you put on this? What is it worth to you? And so let's go back and look at verse 44. Jesus tells these two parables, short parables close together, and they're, they're related to one another. And so let's read these together. It says, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like a treasure hid in a field which a man found and hid again. And from great joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys the field. And so Jesus compares the kingdom to this, this great treasure that's been hidden in the field. The imagery is pretty easy. We can, we can imagine this whole scene. Um, we don't necessarily bury valuable things anymore. I mean, I don't know anybody who buries their stuff. We usually go to the bank and put our money in the bank. But, you know, there was a time when there wasn't the first bank of Jerusalem that you can go and deposit money in, you know, so people would bury their valuables knowing where they were. And so evidently this particular treasure of great value has been buried and forgotten. I don't know if that's the idea. We don't really know exactly how this all panned out, but the parable is there for us to think about this concept of finding a great treasure and going and selling everything you have, buying the field so that you can possess the great treasure. The details are, are kind of iffy, but we know the, the thrust of the parable. We know that this man, when he recognizes what he has found, and he sees it of being great value, it says that with, with great joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has, everything, everything that he has. Think about that for a minute. Think about selling everything that you own, everything that you have, just so you can possess this field, just so you can possess the treasure within it, and that is more valuable to you than anything that you own in this in this life. Now Jesus tells a very similar parable, the next one in verse 45. Look at that one for just a minute, verse 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, it's like a, a merchant, like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and he sold all that he had and he bought it. So in this case, the person is definitely seeking, right? The other case, the, the man you know, maybe he stumbled across it. Maybe, you know, he heard that it was, I don't know. We don't know. But in this case, there's no doubt. The man's seeking out this particular pearl of great value. He knows it exists. He wants it. He's looking for it. He seeks it out. And when he finds it, he sells everything that he has and he buys it. How big is a pearl? Not that big. I mean, they're not very big. Could you imagine somebody doing that today? I mean, just think about that just for just, just a moment. You know a friend, you know somebody, they sell their house, they sell their car, they sell their boat, they sell their business, they sell everything that they own, and they go and they buy a pearl. 
What would you think of that person? What would you think of that neighbor? You think, you're crazy. You're crazy, right? It, I, you probably don't know the value of the pearl. You don't know pearls. I mean, you're not a pearl merchant. You don't know how much it's worth. But your thought is that who would do such a thing? Who would buy such a small little object? But you see, there's value placed on the object. That object in the mind of the seeker is worth more than that person possesses. You see, there's value there. There's value there. And Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like finding something that is so valuable that you're willing to give up everything to possess it. Everything you own, everything that you have, you're willing to give up so that you can own this. You can possess it. You can have it as your own and that's what Jesus is saying about this parable. Now, when we think about this, what came to my mind, of course, is the, the, um, the rich young ruler. Do you remember him? In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus talks about a, a rich young ruler and, that comes to him and, and asks him about obtaining eternal life. How do, how do I get that? What do I need to do uh, to obtain eternal life? And, and then Jesus will say to him uh, that, well, you, you really need to... Keep the commandments, right? That's the essence of it, that you shouldn't murder. Um, that's something that you need to do in order to obtain eternal life. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus tells the man. And the man looks at Jesus and says, uh, I've done all that. I, I, all those things that you told me to do, I've done them. Um, everything that you say, I've never, I've never killed anybody. I've never committed adultery. Um, I love my neighbor. You know, I've never bore fa false witness against uh, somebody else. I've never done any of those things. I've done all that. So now what? What do I need to do now? And then Jesus looks at this man, knowing his heart, because he does, doesn't he? He knows the man's heart. He knows the man's heart. And then he says in verse 21, Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete... If you wish to have eternal life, if you wish to possess it, if you wish to be complete, he says, go and sell your possessions and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. The same kind of idea here, isn't it? It's this idea of, in this case, being a disciple of Jesus, following Jesus, being part of that community, being one of his students, being one of his disciples, and Jesus is saying that, you, you know, you need to get rid of all of your possessions. You go sell them. Go sell everything. You know, go sell everything that you have and come follow me. What if somebody told you that? What if somebody gave you that prerequisite and said, if you truly believe, because that's kind of the idea, isn't it? If you truly believe that I am the Messiah, if you truly believe that I can grant eternal life, if you truly believe that it's through me that you gain access to the Father, if you truly believe that it's through me that you have access to the kingdom of heaven, if you truly believe that, go and sell all of your possessions and follow me. You've got to really believe that that person's the Messiah, don't you? You've got to really put your faith in that person. You've got to be really committed to that. Because that's a tall order, isn't it? Now, Jesus is not saying that this is a prerequisite for everybody to obtain eternal life. That's not the point. But for this particular man, Jesus knew where his heart was, didn't he? His heart was with his possessions. He put more value on what he had and who he was than he did being a disciple of Jesus. He put more value on that stuff and, and the things that he did in the world. He's a young ruler. The people that he ruled over, his position, his power, all of that, he put more value on that than he did being a disciple of Jesus. How do we know that? Because it says that he went away grieving. He went away grieving. And then Jesus says to his disciples, he says, truly I say to you, it is hard. It's hard. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Isn't that interesting? You ever thought about a camel going through the eye of a needle? How possible? I can't even get a thread to go through the eye of a needle. I mean, that's hard. But to, to consider, I mean, what he's saying is it's impossible. It's impossible when a person has put more value on their current possessions than Jesus. It is impossible when a person has put more value on what they have in this world than the kingdom of heaven. It is impossible when the person has valued their own life more than the kingdom of God. It is impossible. That's what Jesus is saying. When you've put more value on that, it's impossible. The pearl of great price. Selling all your possessions. The treasure in the field. Owning it. And being willing to give up everything to possess it. These material possessions. But even relationships. Even relationships require sacrifice, don't they? We understand that in this world. When you, when you get married, you know, you're committed to your spouse. And, and what you're saying, and when you're make, giving those vows on that day, and you're saying that I'm committing myself to you, that I'm committing myself to you over every other relationship that I have in this world, that I'm committing myself to my spouse in such a way that I have let go of any possibility of ever developing or cultivating meaningful relationships with other women or other men. Isn't that what we're saying? We're saying that you are my focus, you are my primary, that I'm willing to continue living this life with you, that you are the one. And the others are going to have to go away. That's what we're supposed to be saying. That ultimate commitment to that person, relationships, relationships are important. And Jesus is going to tell us in Matthew chapter 10 that relationships are so important so important that the relationship that we have with Him, the relationship that we have with God, needs to be far surpassing above any relationship that we have in this world. Even our relationships, our possessions, yes, we can see that, right? That might be easy for us. I can let go of my stuff. But sometimes, relationships, that's the hard part, isn't it? Sometimes that's the, that's the clincher. It was in Jesus' day, and it can be today as well. Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. What did the Jews expect? Peace on the earth. They, they expected all the strife and all the political unrest, all the social unrest, all of the, the division in the Jews. They expected all that to go away. Jesus said, don't think I, I came here to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a, bring a sword. And then he says, for I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. The Jewish community expected peace, but they expected peace on their own terms. They expected peace on their own personal desires and expectations. They kind of, we say sometimes, they wanted, they, um, they wanted to have their cake and eat it too. They wanted everything. They wanted everything that they were and everything that they had, and all the relationships they had in this world. They wanted all that, but then they also wanted the kingdom. They wanted this relationship with the Messiah. And Jesus is saying that, you know, sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes there's going to be strife within the family. Sometimes there are going to be people within your family that will not accept the gospel. Sometimes there will be people who will not hear the words of Jesus and accept the kingdom. So there will be people where the seed is going to fall on the hearts of people and it's not going to grow. And that person might very well be your daughter. That person might be your spouse. That person might be your father. And you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to make a choice. Are, are you going to join with them and follow them in rejecting the Messiah? Are you going to join with them and follow them in, in continuing to wait for the kingdom to come? Or are you going to... Follow me, Jesus would say. Are you going to accept the fact that I brought the kingdom? Because that happened. Those were real situations. Those were real problems in Jesus' day. People had to make that kind of decision. And it may even cost them their lives to be kicked out of your home, to be kicked out of your family because you accepted Jesus as the Messiah. That's hard to swallow. It's hard to think about, but it's true. 
No doubt there's going to be peace between the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus is bringing that through his blood. There's no doubt about that. There's going to be peace between the church and God through the blood of Jesus. Jesus is bringing that. But there's also going to be strife also for those who reject Jesus, reject the message, reject the gospel versus those who accept it. It's going to create some problems. It's going to create some difficulties. In verse 37, Jesus says that he who loves his father and mother, he who loves his father and mother more than me, I don't think that moved. Hold on a second. There you go. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take up his cross and follow after me, Jesus says he's not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Now, all of this seems very extreme, doesn't it? It seems very intense. It seems very extreme. It's, you're thinking to yourself, Jesus, what are you talking about? Are you saying that I shouldn't value those relationships? Are you saying that I shouldn't cultivate those relationships? Are you saying that I shouldn't compromise to maintain those relationships? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Are you saying that there's a possibility that I will lose my relationship with my father? because I've accepted the kingdom message? Are you saying that there's a possibility that I might lose a relationship with my daughter because I've accepted the kingdom message and they haven't? Is that what you're telling me? What Jesus is saying is that the relationship that we have with Him, the relationship that we have with the Father, the relationship that we have with heaven should far surpass any relationship that we have on this earth. Our possessions, our relationships, God needs to be number one. Jesus needs to be on the top of that list. The kingdom of heaven needs to have more value to us than anything this world has to offer, even a relationship. That's hard, isn't it? It's tough. Does Jesus value relationships? Does God value relationships? Yes, of course he does. He, he is the one that, that brought about the relationship of marriage. He is the one that... that trains us to raise our children and have that relationship with our children. God values relationships. But, but, it is possible to be so wrapped up in those worldly relationships that we give up on God. We give up on the kingdom. We give up on Jesus and we stop following him because there are things in this world that are more important to us than the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is making this point. This needs to be priority. This needs to be top. This needs to be on above par, right up there at the top of the list. We need to value the kingdom of heaven above all things. So back to our question. What is the kingdom of heaven worth to you? What is it worth to you? What kind of value have you placed on the kingdom of heaven? Are you willing to sell all that you have and with joy buy the field and possess the treasure, the kingdom? Are you willing to do that? That's the challenge, isn't it? Are we willing to make that sacrifice? Are we willing to make that commitment? Do you consider the value of the kingdom of heaven greater than all that you possess, all your physical possessions? Have, have you placed the kingdom over everything and everyone in your life? Have you placed the value of the kingdom of heaven over your mother and your father and your daughter and, this, and your spouse? Because that, that's what we're looking at. That's what Jesus is encouraging us to do. Place the value of the kingdom over all those things. Have you put the interests of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ Jesus over your own self-interests? Have you placed God's goals over your goals? God's plans over your plans? God's purpose over your purpose? Have you taken up your cross to follow Jesus? Have you taken up your cross to follow Jesus? Have you sold your possessions mentally and spiritually so that you will have treasure in heaven? Or have you gone away grieving at the thought of losing those things? God is very patient, isn't he? We started off this lesson talking about time, and there's no doubt that God is patient. God is patient with us. He is willing. He is willing to let the seed grow in the heart. And we ought to be grateful for that. He's willing to let the seed grow in the heart. He is willing. He is willing to let the tares grow alongside the wheat. God is patient. God is patient. 
And he is willing. He's willing to let the seed grow into a tree and leaven influence the dough. God is patient, but... But what we see from Jesus' parables is there is a day that's coming, isn't there? There is a judgment day. There is a day that's coming. There is a day that the harvest is coming. There is a day that the net's going to be drug in. There is going to be a point in time where God's going to say enough is enough and this is the time and this is it. And we don't even know when that time's going to be. We have no idea. But God said it's coming. Jesus says it's coming. There will be a time where God will separate the righteous and the wicked. How valuable is the kingdom of heaven to you? Have you placed everything at the foot of the cross? Are you willing to sacrifice everything for Jesus? Have you put more value on the kingdom of heaven than all of your possessions, all of your relationships in this life? Because that's what it calls for. Total and complete commitment to King Jesus. And it begins at baptism, doesn't it? It begins at the moment that we obey the gospel and we are buried with Jesus and our sins are forgiven and we come up out of that water, a new creation in Christ Jesus, and we begin our life all anew, brand new. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Isn't it a wonderful feeling to be forgiven? That's when it all begins, when we obey the gospel and we are baptized into Jesus and we die and we're resurrected to walk in newness of life and we begin to walk the kingdom life and do the things that God desires of us. And, and what a wonderful day that's going to be, the day that, that God is going to come and he's going to gather up his people and he's going to take us all into his presence forever, for all eternity. So this morning, if you have not obeyed the gospel, if you have not been baptized into Jesus, if you have not had your sins washed away, this is the time. It's time to begin as we stand and as we sing. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me after thy will, while I am way. me and try me master today wider than snow Lord wash me just now as in thy presence humbly I bow have thine own way Again, good morning to all, especially uh, visitors, if we have any. I remember seeing any, but if you are a visitor with us this morning, we're glad you're here. I'm glad that uh, Steve was able to join us. Uh, he seems to be doing well, which we all are thankful for. Uh, I direct your attention to the uh, notes that you got coming in. Be sure and read those. and. Uh, a lot of information there I'll let you read for yourself. Some uh, additional ones, just uh, uh, apparently somebody at Ron's office tested positive this past week, so he's in two-week quarantine. We won't see him for a while. And uh, 
Thursday will be Peggy and I's 55th wedding anniversary. Uh, no party, but cash gifts would be accepted. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to know the secret to a long wedding, uh, ask somebody else, because I don't have a clue. <laughs> so, anyway, that's all the announcements I have, unless somebody has something else. Thank you. Let's be standing for the closing song. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we come to you thanking you for the many blessings that you give us and your love and grace and mercy. And, and we just thank you the opportunity we have to meet here and hear a lesson from your word. And we thank you for Sean that brings the lesson to us. And, and we thank you for this congregation and we pray for those that are dealing with health problems and, lo and loss of loved ones. Lord, uh, I want to pray for all our men and women that are in the military and men and women in the, police, in the police and first responders and caregivers. And Lord, we just pray for our nation and we thank you for the leaders of our nation and we pray for them and we thank you for the freedom we have, Lord, to worship you and, and without fear of interference. And Lord, we just thank you for this region and we thank you for the recent rain we've had and we thank you especially for Jesus and the sacrifices that he has made for us. And it is in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs>